Welcome to the Sewing Basket here in Plymouth, Wisconsin. Today we're going to talk about layering your quilt, getting your quilt top put together with your layers. It's a very common question. It's not a difficult process. It just needs to be done in a certain way. There are many, many different ways to do it. We're going to talk about three. I'm going to give you the tips that I like that work the best for me. Again, this isn't the only way you can do it, but it will help with problems like wrinkling, um, puckers in the back of your quilt. We'll talk about some of the things to resolve those issues. I'm going to do everything in small scale. Um, obviously, we don't have the camera space or room to baste an entire quilt, but the process is the same no matter what size project you're doing. So the first thing we're going to talk about is pin basting. This is the fabric that I've picked for the back of my miniature quilt. And the basic steps are you press your backing, put your batting on top, your quilt top on top of that, and pin baste your layers together. But you need to hold your backing in place. And this is where one of the first problems occur for most people. You'll see things that say use some tape and hold down your back which is a good idea. You don't want wrinkles in it. And I did press this, it doesn't look like it. I needed a little bit more best press to get some of the wrinkles out. But I'm gonna then take some tape and I'm gonna just hold down the edges. And I can do my corners and I can also do along all the edges. But what you don't wanna do when you tape, and this is what causes the most problems, they, you'll see different things that say, oh, stretch it taut. Taut is good, stretched is not. So if I pull this, if you watch across here, I pull this, see how that wrinkles? You don't want wrinkles in there. And when I pull in different directions, I can pull here and then I can pull the wrinkles out and tape it all down and it's stretched. It actually looks smooth and you think that's a good thing. But as soon as you pin everything together and you take that tape off, that stretch lets go and that's where all the puckers come from on the back of your quilt. So the key word is taut, but not stretched. So I'm not pushing this hard. See how I'm getting wrinkles there? I'm just gently smoothing it out, and I'm going to put some tape on this side. And again, if you have a big quilt, you want a large surface area to do this. It's hard on your back if you do it on the floor. Um, you can do it there, but like our classroom area, you're welcome to use that if you call and reserve a time to use the classroom. You can use our tables. Um, places like your, sometimes the churches or um, libraries will have tables available. So check around if you need a place to do it. The floor works, but again, it's hard on your back. So I have one last piece of tape here. And on a big quilt, you're gonna tape all the way around. See how I've got just a little bit of movement here, but it's smooth. Big quilt, you're going to tape all the way around, so it takes a bit of tape. I don't like to use masking tape. Masking tape is stickier, so it holds a little bit better, but it also sticks to the fabric, and a lot of times, especially if you've got an older roll of masking tape, it's been around a while, the sticky from the tape leaves glue residue on your fabric. So I prefer to use painter's tape, and um, you can use any width that you want. This happens to be one inch. Um, works fine, wider works okay too. So first thing, first back down, then I'm gonna take whatever batting I choose. I'm not going to talk too much about batting today. We did an entire series on batting tips. Um, Cheryl did that, it is on our Daily Dose page, on our YouTube channel, all the different options for batting. The only thing you worry about, I'm gonna worry about today is my batting, how far I can quilt apart. The wrapper of your batting will always tell you quilt up to six, eight, 10 inches apart. I should say the wrapper of a good quality batting will tell you that. If you don't know what your batting is, you don't want to quilt more than four inches apart or that batting can start to wad up and pucker inside your quilt. So be sure you use a good quality batting and pay attention to how close you need to do your stitching. So I take my piece of batting, my backing is always biggest, and then I take my piece of batting and again, I'm smoothing this, but I'm not pushing and stretching. I don't want to get those, those puckers in there. So this is taped down. This is just smooth. Again, not stretched. 
and then I'm going to take the top, my quilt top, goes face up. And my quilt top, you'll notice, is a little bit smaller than my batting. I always want a little bit more room. On a big quilt, I want at least a couple of inches. Here, I wanted to be sure I'd get on the camera, so I only left myself about a half an inch because we're just demoing. But on a big quilt, you want your batting bigger, your batting, at, excuse me, your backing bigger, you're batting at least a couple inches bigger all the way around. And again, I'm smoothing, but I'm not stretching and pushing. And I'm going to use safety pins for pin basting. A couple things about safety pins. Every now and then we'll have somebody come in the store to get safety pins and they'll say, but they're bent. They're bent for a reason. They are quilting pins. They are made to layer your quilt. When they're bent, you can push them in and back up. If you have a straight pin, straight pin, hard to see there, um, I go through and it's hard to get it back up. So don't use straight pins. You want to use the curved basting pins. There are different sizes. You'll find whatever you like best as you try different sizes. These, I think, are the inch and a quarter. Um, these go down. I push through all my layers and it'll pop right back up for me. Hopefully you can see that when you go through. You're going to go through and it'll come right back up. And then I'm going to close that pin. I'm going to close that pin, I say. Sometimes it's twisting a little bit on me. I've got a soft surface underneath here. Okay, there's my first pin. Next question is, how far apart do I put those pins? Um, you don't want more than about a fist width apart. So approximately four inches. So even if your batting says you can quilt up to 10 inches apart, you want more pins than that. You want it all held in place so that when you are quilting, you've got room, uh, excuse me, you've got your top held into place so it's not shifting when you're stitching. The reason that I like to know my basting distance on my quilt batting is that I can kind of plan where my pins go. Obviously here I've got just a solid piece of fabric but if this were, say, a nine patch, and I was going to quilt diagonally through the nine patch, when I place my pins, I don't want it dead center and in the corners, because that's right where I'm going to be quilting. So I try to plan pace, placing my pins, say that three times fast, um, so that my pins are not where I'm going to stitch. So if I have that nine patch, I'm not going to put it in the center. I'm going to put it in the places that aren't going to get stitching. So I'm going to just grab my pins and I'm going to go again about a fist width apart. I started in the middle and I'm going to work my way out. One on this side, one over here. And then I'm going to go oops, catch that one. Then I'm going to go forward. And again, I'm just smoothing it as I go. Up to the edge. Down here. And I'm going to continue working my way out all the way around. That is the process for pin basting your quilt. Again, if you do not do enough pins, you're going to get shifting, movement, puckers, and wrinkles. So it sounds like you need a lot of pins. You do. But it's very important that you put enough pins in it if you're going to use this process. The other thing about pins, these are quilters basting pins. They are bent. They're stainless steel, which means they won't rust if you leave them in your project for a long time and your sewing room happens to be damp. If they're not stainless steel, they can rust and leave rust spots on your fabric. And the other thing is, if you buy inexpensive pins, they are, when they're made, they don't come to a point. It's just a wire that they snip off. And so the ends are very, very blunt. You go to push it through your fabric and it'll snag your fabric. So you can say, oh yeah, these pins are $4 or these pins are $8 for however many you get. You're going to, if you're a pin baster, you're going to use those pins over and over and over again for years. So invest in good quality pins that are stainless steel, have a sharp point, and are the size that you like to use. So that is the pin basting process. When you're done, you're going to just peel the tape off. I'm not going to take the time to do that. I'm going to pull the whole thing up. And then I'm ready to quilt. We're not talking about quilting today. We're just talking about prep. But my back is nice and smooth. 
You can see as I stitch through here, there it's not getting any big puckers in it because I had that nice and smooth, but it wasn't stretched. So that is the process for pin basting. The next process we're going to use is fusible batting. This is a piece of fusible batting. I like the Quilter's Dream, their fusible 80-20 blend. Um, this comes in throw size at 60 by 60. It also comes in twin size, which is 93 by 72. As far as I know, they don't make it larger than that. Usually when I go larger than that, I take it to a long armor. Um, but I want fusible batting and the, it's always marked. It'll say fusible side up, but you can tell one side will feel a little bit rougher. The other side is very smooth. The rough side is the glue side. So I'm going to take my backing piece and this one I already have fused down. It's same process as before. I'm going to put a little bit of tape on my back. So I'm going to just go around. I'm going to tape those pieces down. Again, not tight, not stretched, just taut. Tape it all the way around. Then I'm going to put my fusible batting down and um, then my top comes next. However, um, sorry, when, uh, when I do fusible batting, I typically do it in reverse order. Sorry about that. I put my batting down, glue side up, I lay my backing over the top, and then I iron it because I want to be ironing from this side, okay? Once I have my batting fused in place, so I have my batting face up on my ironing board, my backing face down, press. It ends up looking like this. So my batting is all held in place. I just peeled this off a little bit, but it is stuck on there. Now I would tape it down just to hold it so it doesn't shift. And now I'm going to put my top piece on. And on my top piece, I have two choices. I can either spray base this or pin based. If I pin based, I do exactly what I did before. I tape it down and I pin every four inches or so, again, about a fist width apart. Otherwise, I can use a fusible spray to hold this in place. The reason that I put the fusible batting fused to the back is when you're quilting, no matter what type of quilting you're doing, as you're moving around, if I'm doing free motion quilting, I can control what's happening on the top. I can see if I've got a wrinkle and I can smooth it out, but you can't see the back. If the batting is fused to your backing, that back is smooth with no wrinkles. So it's a great way to have that back be nice and smooth for you. And you don't have to worry about what's happening on the underside. So that is fusible batting to the back. And then we're gonna spray base this I'm going to do this on um, the other sample, and uh, the process is the same. So that is fusible batting. This one, I'm going to use spray based on both pieces. So I have my backing, I have any plain batting that I want, and my quilt top. So here, I'm going to tape my pieces down. And again, we're going to pretend I've done that all the way around. And then I'm going to take my batting and I'm going to lay this down and just smooth it out. Again, don't push and get wrinkles. And then I'm going to take my fusible spray. We use 505 fusible spray. Comes in two different sizes. Small can is $12.99. Big one is $19.99. We have both of them on the website and here in the store if you need that. So the trick with 505 spray is give it a good shake. It has a little bit of an overspray and scent, so be sure that you're in a well-ventilated area. You do not need a ton of this. Be spraying the whole thing. You don't need that much. So what you're going to do is peel your batting halfway back. And this is the same. If you have a big quilt, you're going to peel that whole piece halfway back. Give it a good shake. And I typically spray my batting. You can spray your backing. I just find it easier to spray my back. And what I'm doing is I'm gonna just spritz. 
You can see I'm not using a ton, just a spritz, spritz, spritz. Give it a second, and then I'm going to lay it down on here. Again, I don't want to be pushing to stretch. I want to lay it in place, and now I'm going to pat. Okay, and I'm going to go over the whole thing, and I'm going to pat that into place. And again, if you have a big quilt, you're pat, pat, patting that whole quilt. And what this is doing is it's bonding the batting to the backing fabric without stretching it. If I do this and push, it's actually pulling the glue away from the fabric because the batting is going to stretch differently than the fabric. So pat, 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 and then I peel back the other side. And you can see that's where it started to stick. And then I'm going to just... Be careful where you're working that you don't get a lot of overspray. You don't want to be have your can way up here and getting a lot of spray. You can see I held it pretty close and just little spritzes. If you are working on a surface you need to protect, you can put some paper underneath or scrap batting works well. And again, I'm going to lay this down and I'm just going to pat it into place. Okay. And I'm going to give it a minute or two to dry. And then I'm going to take my quilt top and I'm going to do the same thing. Again, lay it in place, not pressure, just smoothing, not pushing to stretch. Okay. And then I'm going to do the same thing I did with the batting. Halfway across. And like I said, I like to spray the batting. And that lays here. Pat that into place. Again, size, the backing is biggest. Then your batting on a big quilt, you want at least a few inches of excess batting all the way around. And then your quilt top. And then this side peels back. You can see where that gripped. And I'm gonna lay that, again, I'm smoothing, but not stretching. And then pat, 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 pat gets it in place. This works great. It does, there are different brands. We've tried a lot. We like 505 the best. It doesn't gunk up your needle. Um, it holds really, really well. And that is your process. So I take this off and I've got my layers are together and I'm ready to go. One thing that I do sometimes when I have a really large quilt um, I don't on table runners, baby quilts, but if I have a really big quilt and I know I'm going to be crisscrossing in all different directions and rolling it one way and rolling it another to get it through my machine, I'll actually add just a couple pins to give it a little bit of extra support. Um, just a couple pins. I'll stick one in the near the middle of the project and then I'll put a pin maybe every 12 to 14 inches, just maybe even a little further than that one at each corner and a couple along the edges. That way, if it starts to let loose a little bit, doesn't happen often, but if it does, it stops when it hits that pin and I don't have to go back and lay everything out again and smooth it out and um, deal with any of those issues. So a couple strategically placed pins will help keep everything when I go to roll that to get it into my machine. So that is the process of layering your quilt pin-based, spray-based, or the combination of fusible batting and spray-based.